Now we'll move into our blueprint implementation plan draft presentation. Good evening, President Claggett, Dr. Townsell, and members of the board. My name is Joe Sampson III, coordinator of Maryland Leeds Grant and Blueprint for Maryland's Future for Calvert County Public Schools. And with me this evening is Mr. Tony Navarro, our Chief Operations Officer and Chairperson for Pillar 2, and Ms. Jackie Jacobs, Director of System and Instructional Performance and Chairperson for Pillar 1. My aim today is to provide you a review of our implementation plan writing in summary form for pillars one and two. The two required pillar one objectives for this year's plan are objectives one and three, which are to expand high quality publicly funded full day pre-K and expand family supports. Each section of the implementation plan template is organized by uh, subsections that are aligned to the statute, which is reflected in the numbers, for example, the 1.1.1 and 1.1.2. And what I will do is discuss each statute and explain how we've addressed it in our implementation response. So 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 um, indicates to expand access to full day pre-K for tier one, three and four year old children and tier two, four-year-old children. The challenges facing the school system include communication, space, and programming shifts. And some short-term operational changes uh, include moving all four-year-old programs to full day and ensuring each of the 12 elementary schools houses at least one full day classroom. Increasing staffing for the four-year-old program by hiring 12 additional IAs and 1.5 pre-kindergarten teachers and development of procedures and guidelines to manage student enrollment. Long-term operational changes include studying a committee plan, um, a study committee to plan for the implementation of a three-year-old program to include logistics of location, space, curriculum, time allocation, staffing, and transportation. 1.1.3, implement a high quality mixed delivery system for pre-K. The challenges face, facing the distribution of public and private pre-kindergarten slots are number one, lack of large franchise childcare centers along with the willingness to participate. Two, the ability for the private providers to hire and retain qualified pre-K staff aligned to the blueprint requirements, which ultim ultimately impacts the ability of the school system to support the delivery of instruction and supports for groups of students in the private provider setting. Also to leverage resources, we will explore staffing models, purchasing of materials and professional development models through partnering with Head Start in um, several different ways and private providers to provide, to participate in yearly professional development opportunities provided by the school system. 1.1.4 in the case that LEA shall enter a, a memorandum of understanding with MSDE and each eligible private provider participating in a publicly funded pre-K in the county and all other applicable government agencies. So identified partners can expect an agreement to focus on appropriate services, resources, protocols, professional learning costs, and also invited to participate in each student's family service plan and IEP individualized education plan based on the understanding that input from pri private providers is deemed valuable as a reflection of the child in their natural environment. Currently, there are no agreed upon costs between the school system and private providers. Administrative costs that may be considered inc uh, include expense for personnel, expenses related to the development and implementation of the mixed delivery system, and expenses related to the development and implementation of a transportation plan for families whose children are enrolled with private providers. The, 
The next one, MSDE shall require public and private providers to meet high quality standards to receive public funding. CCPS will work collaboratively with private providers, key county agencies, and community partners to ensure that students and families have access to comprehensive services. CCPS will also partner with Head Start, working collaboratively on curriculum and professional learning for all pre-K staff, and also partnering with the College of Southern Maryland and local universities such as Bowie State to create partnerships that will build the teacher pipeline for early childhood teachers. CCPS will support teaching assistants in obtaining the necessary credential requirements set forth by the blueprint beginning in school year 2025-26. Next session is administer an unbiased kindergarten readiness assessment to all incoming kindergarten students. We have implemented steps to ensure the staff responsible for administering the KRA receive the guidelines and necessary training to include meeting with the meeting monthly with the school testing coordinator, setting up modules for their first year of administration and a refresher course in subsequent years. 1.5.1 talks about Judy centers and we currently have two Judy centers in the county servicing 386 families and is planning um, to write possibly for a third Judy center um, for the next school year. Additionally, we're exploring the viability of adding a satellite site and the prerequisites of being in a Title I school or having a community vulnerability score of 0.6 limit the number of Judy centers for Calvert County, but we continue to explore other options to support families. Pillar two, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. There are four required objectives for this year's implementation plan for pillar two, objective one, two, three, and five. So recruit and support high quality and diverse teachers, increase rigor of the teacher prep programs, establish a new statewide career ladder, and improve educator compensation. The first monitor the quality and diversity of state teacher candidates and existing teacher workforce. Hiring data from previous years has demonstrated that CCPS has had a difficult time hiring teachers in certain subject areas. These areas include the secondary education areas of math and science, as well as grade levels in special, all grade levels in special education. This is evident using vacancy data and timeline data for hiring in these areas when a vacancy occurs. So we're working with HR and they're partnered with the Department of Instruction, Informational Technology to create a student staff demographic comparison dashboard that can be used to track our progress on the blueprint aligned goal of matching our teacher and student demographics. The next one is revised teacher prep programs to meet new requirements. Although the revision of teacher prep programs is the responsibility of the college or university, we have established relationships with local colleges um, and universities such as Bowie State University offering credits, College of Southern Maryland um, offering credits, Frostburg University, just to name a few. The next section is developing and implementing pathways for paraprofessionals to become certified teachers. CCPS hosts the Teacher Academy of Maryland CTE program in all four comprehensive high schools, which focuses on human growth and development through adolescence, teaching as a profession, curriculum and instruction, and an education academy internship. Students can receive college credit and scholarships to several Maryland baccalaureate teacher education programs. We also host a Future Education Professionals Conference um, and that's designed to encourage or expose students in grades eight and nine to the teaching professions. And it's held this year on April 14th at Bowie State University. Um, and that's done through CTA. Um, CCPS also supports our education, educational support professionals by providing pathways to obtaining MSDE teacher certification through reduced pricing for educational support staff and conditional teachers. 
2.4.1, LEAs and MSDE shall implement a new program to support and encourage teachers to obtain and maintain national board certification, particularly teachers from historically underrepresented popula populations. We have established communication with counties and their respective national board certification coordinators that have existing programs in place to determine best practices um, that we can implement here in Calvert County. Um, and also established NBC facilitators uh, to support NBC teacher candidates. The goal is to develop and expand a cohort model for our NBC candidates um, that will support them throughout their journey. In collaboration with Human Resources, um, we will survey teachers to determine interest and potential barriers to pursuing NBC in order to try to reach our teachers from underrepresented populations. The next section is 2.4.2. LEA shall implement a, an education, educator career ladder on or before July 1st, 2024. We've established a career ladder development board to set standards for teachers to achieve each tier of the career ladder. This is op optional for school districts, but we felt it best to form this collaboration to better prepare for the implementation of the career ladder requirement. The next section, LEA shall encourage teachers to obtain master degrees in fields that require special expertise, have shortage areas, and enhance the teacher's professional skills and qualifications so that teachers are able to teach dual enrollment courses as adjunct faculty at post-secondary institutions, including by provi providing additional compensation as appropriate and through collective bargaining. So we currently have an agreement with the College of Southern Maryland that supports dual enrollment courses being taught by CCPS teachers at our local high schools during the regular school day. Our content area supervisors work in collaboration with the College of Southern Maryland to ensure that the courses offered at our local high schools meet the standards for dual enrollment courses. The challenges in the forthcoming years to implement the blueprint include funding those costs subject to negotiations such as the local share for the NBC salary increases, salary increases for teachers not identified by the blueprint, developing a career ladder salary schedule to incent teachers to opt into the career ladder, and salary negotiations with administrators and educational support professionals. In addition, there'll be a need for increased staffing in many areas of the school system to implement the blueprint requirements. 2.5.4, implement initial 10% salary increase for teachers by June 30th, 2024. CCPS and CEA have agreed upon the salary increases that will satisf satisfy this blueprint mandate. The challenges in the forthcoming years to implement the blueprint include funding those costs, again, subject to negotiations for those salary increases mentioned prior, uh, prior to this slide. 2.5.5, implement a minimum $60,000 starting teacher salary by 7-1-2026. So preparations to satisfy the blueprint requirement of a minimum um, salary include determining all fiscal options and a timeline to satisfy the requirement, understanding by all stakeholders that the mandate is a shared cost between the state and the county, and important that an outcome of stakeholder engagement um, for understanding that the blueprint funding is and accountability uh, necessitates changes to present, present operations of Calvert County Public Schools and then conduct negotiations with CEA to develop the salary scale. Um, in the area of stakeholder engagement, uh, this response just identifies who we work with for collaboration and feedback, such as the Career Ladder Development Board, county commissioners, bargaining units such as CEA, CASE, and CASA, as well as how we engage the community through blueprint messaging which occurs through social media, school messenger, email, virtual and in-person stakeholder meetings and focus groups. So our next steps, um, that summarizes the overall implementation plan writing for pillars one and two. Um, we're gonna present a similar summary of our implementation plan draft responses at the next board meeting on March the 9th, focusing on pillars three, four and five. 
Um, a reminder went out this evening that our town hall meeting will be held on February 28th um, at 6.30 p.m. and that's when we'll give an overview of the blueprint in general. And then for anyone who wants to participate in a more detailed look at our implementation plan responses, each individual response by pillar, we will have individual pillar sessions scheduled to allow community members to engage with the questions and responses and provide feedback. Um, so those will happen again individually by pillar um, and the dates are listed there for pillar one, March the 6th, um, pillar two, March 1st, pillar three, March 7th, pillar four, March 10th, and pillar five, March 13th. Um, while pillar five is two days before the plan submission date, the idea is that um, that focuses on accountability um, and reporting and there's not a whole lot in terms of how we report because a lot of that is mandated. Um, so that's why we were able to do that one a little closer to that, that date. Any questions? You don't have questions? Ms. Post, first of all, I love, love, love the town halls. And I love that we're going to have information sessions and, and feedback. I think that's wonderful. So in that, have we, have we made any strides or any effort to reach out to the county um, to see about getting this information to, to folks in the community that, that own dirt but don't have children in the school system? I know a lot of the information goes out to us because we have kids, so we see it, but has, has, have we made any effort to do that yet? So our Calvert County Blueprint Committee uh, meets monthly. We did have a conversation about other means of communication and outreach um, and the county commissioner's office is taking everything that we put out and putting it on their website as well, um, trying to duplicate our efforts. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, and I've also uh, connected with our chief communications officer to find other avenues of, of reaching out. So we're looking at developing sort of a one pager that'll go out via email um, as well as posting videos on each pillar um, and then just continue outreach through the principals to try to send information through their newsletters when we have these town hall meetings and individual pillar events. Yeah. Thank you. Um, on your, the 1.1.5, 1 uh, and I, it was really related to pre-K, um, do we know how many providers in our community are, are going to participate? Has that information been determined or have we asked? So um, they participate through a grant process. The grant has not opened yet. However, we had one private provider last year who applied um, and then that was pulled back. At this point in time, we've had outreach with private providers in multiple ways. Um, and we are not getting an indication that anyone is interested in participating. And part of that is through um, questions about going through the whole process of completing the grant. The other piece of the grant requires that they have a certificated teacher in early childhood in that classroom and that their salary matches ours. And so that typically does not have those same things within a private provider daycare setting. Um, we do have Head Start, um, which is a grant funded program that is considered private providers and we continue to work with Head Start. Um, so that will be part of our um, private provider piece, but we have not had um, enough buy-in or want for them to apply for the grant. Do we know how many kids we think are going to be in pre-K here? So we're still trying to determine that because part of the um, piece with Pillar 1 is that we have to be able to provide access to um, what is considered Tier 1, which is up to 300% of the poverty level. And so trying to first identify how many students we have coming into pre-K or would be pre-K eligible, and then of those, how we determine their income level and eligibility. So we have tried to look at it through several different means. One, what does our current pre-K look like? What does our current kindergarten look like? So that we can try to figure out what that might be. 
Um, so before we offer services to students who are between three and 600% of the poverty level, we have to have space available for up to 300%. And that's tiered in over a couple of years. So we're really starting with our four-year-olds right now um, to see what that will look like and what and how many people would be interested because it is a choice. Okay, and then also in that same box, it says support instructional assistance with credentialing requirements. What, what, what does that support look like? What? So um, any IA in a pre-K setting, setting has to have their, um, oh, it just went right out of my head. CDA, CDA or a bachelor or a um, associate's degree. And so we are supporting our current IAs to identify if they have a bachelor's degree, and if they don't, what the process is for them to go through to get their CDA. So we have some IAs who are almost done with their bachelor's, so we're helping support that way. But we have brought in um, IAs here at the central office and provided professional development on their portfolios that they would put together so that they can complete the CDA process. And we have several of them going through that currently. So I just have two more questions and I promise I'll shut up unless there's another presentation then I might have questions. Uh, for the National Board Certified Teachers, um, I know that once that is achieved, then they only are in a classroom 50% of the time. So in, in that, I guess the question is how do we intend to fill the void in the classrooms when we do have, you know, whatever that number looks like? Uh, I don't I guess it's kind of a rhetorical question at this point. I don't know. Um, because in, in the same breath, we also are saying how much of increased staffing we need to implement the blueprint. So um, when are we going to sound the alarms? Because I feel like we might already be there, right? Because we don't have any, we don't have enough of any of this. So I, you know, I, I just don't know how we're going to sustain and then get our test scores up and then in, increase student outcome and you know close the gap and I digress um, I had a question about um, the actual building itself has anyone looked into the cost to actually create that classroom because you now have to have restrooms with lower commodes lower sinks lower um, fountains, things like that? So um, our construction department, had, we have been working closely with them to identify what locations within our current buildings. Our process right now and going into next year is really about how we move our half-day programs to full-day programs. And so um, expanding that piece of it and then looking at the schools that currently do not have a pre-K program in there where within the building is that best situated. So we are working with them to make sure we can identify those pieces. You had stated that um, you're going to support staff in their efforts to become certified. And, <laughs> you know, that sounds a lot like um, make sure you're taking care of your mental health. You know, great words, great sentiments, but what did we actually do to support that? And I'm wondering, what does that actually look like? What will actually be done to support um, teachers trying to pursue this, this certification? So the support I was talking about was for our instructional assistance. And we've had, um, we have a coordinator in the Department of Instruction who is specifically working with them one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. She has reviewed their portfolios, identified where they need to go, what might match what they've currently done with what are the requirements of the CDA. So it is personalized support where she is sitting down with them and working through that process. Is there any type of um, like group that, that um, can go through it together and like a support group? So a cohort, yes. Yeah. So yeah, cohort, they've had... They've had several meetings, and so they work through as a cohort, but then they also are working individually because what I might need might be very different than what Joe might need based on what he's already done so far or what courses he's taken. So the nice thing is, is that there have been some evening sessions. There have been some during a two-hour early dismissal day, so it's within their work day, um, and they've done things virtually with the um, instructional assistants to really think about 
what do they need to support them in this process? And um, our coordinator in the Department of Instruction is doing a phenomenal job helping them understand the process and then to look at what they've currently done and how that um, aligns with the requirements of the CDA or doesn't and then what they might need to do. So there has been that individualized support and in a cohort. Fantastic, thank you. Welcome. Ms. Post, I have, a, I have a comment regarding the 60% uh, and 40% yes. that you referenced. Pardon me? It's on my, oh, it's my, I was gonna say it's on this time. Sorry. Yes, regarding the 60% and 40%. Yes. Yes, te uh, teachers on levels one, two, and three of the career ladder will teach an average of 60% of their day. The other 40% is spent on other teacher activities, including improving instruction, identifying, working with, and tutoring students who need additional help, working with the most challenging students, leading or participating in professional learning. And the phase in of that 6040 is done over an eight year period beginning July 1, 2025, and it's determined by the Board of Education as approved by the Accountability and Implementation Board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question. Um, when you're talking about the testing of these children, is that going to be done during the typical school week where teachers are going to have to try to figure how I'm going to test this child one-on-one -on -one and what I'll do with the other 24 during that time? So are you referencing the KRA? <clears throat> Um, 1. Administer K readiness assessment, and you'll make sure this ensure the staff receives the necessary training. So yes, the KRA is done um, within the kindergarten classroom with the instructional assistant there to support, and so they work together in a collaborative effort to make sure that all students are tested at the beginning of the year. Okay, so during this testing, how much actual instruction time will be lost? I know. In previous years, it, it took, I know, at least a solid week, if not more, to test all those children. Do we have any idea what, what time frame this is going to take to test all the kids? Um, I do not, but I can get that information for you. Okay. Lisa and I got together and we, it, before this meeting, and we, just, we, had a, we decided we were going to have a competition about who was going to ask the most questions. Um, I think I'm winning, for the record. Uh, just one last question. When, to go back to the instructional assistance and helping them achieve uh, getting a certificate or a bachelor's degree, uh, are these the same instructional assistants that the starting salary is 14 or $15 an hour? Are those the ones we're talking about? So um, I don't know the starting salary. It is the IA2s. Okay. Um, I believe within the pre-K program okay. um, and it would be an associate's degree. Okay, thank Just you. To clarify. So again, Ms. Post mentioned hourly rates. Instructional assistants aren't the only employees in the system with low hourly rates or low salaries. So again, let's have the conversation about each not all and not some, each. Um, and that is the purpose of equity. And I think we can support our $22 million budget ask because of the conversations that we are having and the improvements that we need to make in the school system. Any other discussion? All right, thank you. Thank you.